Greetings everyone. On the bench today we have a Class D board in for review. Well, I don't do these as much as I used to, but somebody recommended that I test the TDA 7498E board. And I looked it up and it wasn't too expensive. It was only around $20, give or take. So I figured, eh, sure, why not? We'll take a look at it. This will be the first higher power board meaning beyond the TPA 3116. Usually when I saw the higher power boards, they were a little too expensive to buy. I don't really want to spend 50 bucks on a board just to make a video. That would never pay itself back. So, you know, at 20 bucks, I can roll with this one here. So let's unpack it. Take a whiff of the bag. Mm. Smells like a new pair of tennis shoes. So in the bag here we get the amplifier board and uh, looks like a volume control cap, nylon standoffs. So the board here is a little larger than the other ones, being a higher power board. Now this is the TPA, or I'm sorry, the TDA 7498E. The E on the end means it's the higher power version of the chip. The non-E version is rated for less current. It can't drive 4 ohm loads, whereas the E version is able to drive 4 ohm loads and is rated up to 160 watts per channel. Now that's at 10% distortion, and I don't do that on this channel. I measure the maximum clean power before clipping, which, of course, will give you a lower output rating, but that's to be expected. Take a quick look around the board here. We have the volume control RCA input jacks for line in. We have an input connector here in which they do not give you a cable. Gain select switch here for four different combinations. As I always say on this channel, use only as much gain as needed. Just don't set it all the way high because that can mean more noise and potential distortion. Along the sides here we have rail stiffening caps. So when the amp is called on to deliver high current this helps keep the rail from sagging. On the end here we have screw connectors for left right outputs and power. Looks like we have nice size chokes. Hopefully they selected a the correct value so we don't have that roll off at high frequencies. If you recall me testing the TPA3116 board, some of those had the incorrect value of chokes and we rolled off the high frequencies quite severely. So yeah, we'll do all the tests, the power test, the frequency response, see how this thing performs. Now we have a heat sink here with a fan you know, if they didn't have the fan, they would have to use quite a large heat sink because even though it is Class D, it still has to dissipate some heat. Now this fan will only operate when it's called on to deliver high power and the amplifier gets warm. So this fan will not spin when you're listening at a quieter, lower level. And, you know, it's not required to deliver high power. So yeah, that's the board here on the back. We have, um, let's turn that around. It says to short these jumpers for BTL. So you have these jumpers here and these jumpers here, I guess that is. I can get on those tighter. Yep. Well, that's not quite correct. BTL means bridge tied load or used to mean balanced transformerless, but in this context it's bridge tied load. Well, the outputs of these Class D boards are usually always bridged already. You can tell by the four inductors that it's, it's bridged. And being that it has only single supply and no output coupling capacitors, it's a bridge type output. 
What they really mean is you're paralleling the two bridge channels together so it becomes a one channel amplifier. And the only purpose of doing that is to allow it to handle lower impedance loads because you're splitting the load between the two channels. So I believe it says in the data sheet, when you do that it allows you to drive a 3 ohm load so you can go lower than 4. I'm not sure why they say you can't go all the way to 2, but just a limitation, I guess, of this. Okay, he's powered up, hooked up, and all that good stuff. Let's play some music. Okay, there's some YouTube safe music for you. It sounds pretty good to me. One thing I did notice, I don't know if the camera will pick that up, but there's a little bit of hiss in there. I mean, it's not real bad, but if you had really efficient speakers, that might be an issue. Even when I set the gain to its lowest level, the hiss is about the same. But yeah, that uh, seems to be pretty common with these Class D amps. They have a lot more noise than like a decent Class A, B amp. Okay, I got the load hooked up to the output of the amplifier. Both channels driven. Though at the maximum, I'm probably only going to be able to do uh, one channel driven because I just... Don't have enough power from this supply to test this thing at its full rating. So we'll see how that works out. So let me get you pointed at the oscilloscope here and we'll begin the power tests. Okay, power test time. We have the one kilohertz sine wave. Oh, the little fan just turned on been running for a minute or two already and we get a little bit of wiggle 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 yeah there near clipping uh, other than that I don't see any issues so I'll just have to kind of dial that out about four amps off the supply at 32 volts so we'll run with that I can smell the heat coming off of the resistor bank. So 21, we'll say 21.85. So at 32 volt supply, we're hitting 59.67 watts, eight ohm load. Okay, I took one of the channels off due to the limits of my supply here. I wanna see what it is with a four ohm load. And we'll dial out the clipping. 20.19, we'll say. So we're getting 101.9 watts. Okay, so now we're looking at distortion. Have the FFT mode on the scope set up. This is at 1 kilohertz. That's our fundamental. That would go way off the screen. And I have a 4.5 kilohertz signal added to the input. What that does, being at 1% allows me to compare the harmonic nodes. And I used 4.5 kilohertz because that's non-harmonically related to the signal. So it won't cover up these nodes, in other words. So uh, what we're looking at here, yeah, it's about 0.3, and that's by far the largest. So when you do that calculation of all the nodes, it's really the dominant one that dominates your reading here. So these other ones are small. So yeah, this would be the dominating one, and it's around 0.3%. Now the data sheet says it should be much lower than that. So why am I not doing so hot with this amplifier? Well, it depends on a lot of things. It could be the uh, core material, the, the ferrite core of these chokes they use on the output. But yeah, and it's, it's still not bad. 
I question if you can really hear the distortion under 1%, especially if it's the lower order harmonics like this second order. We've got a third order, a fourth, but the higher orders are, are pretty small. And they say the lower order harmonics are what are more pleasing. So, yeah, I don't see a real problem here, but spec sheet wise, I wouldn't say that it's going to be high fidelity. Okay, now I'm checking at 50 hertz. I have another pilot signal, and I don't really see any nodes here. It's pretty clean. Okay, so now I'm looking at 10 kilohertz. I don't have a pilot signal because my music player wouldn't be able to display a 45 kilo or be able to play a 45 kilohertz pilot tone. But you see we have some harmonics a little bit higher, probably somewhere around half. But then we have this thing way out here, non-harmonically related. So that could be some noise from somewhere. That's at 95 kilohertz. It could be uh, something from the switching artifacts. I don't know. I'd have to investigate it further. Okay, frequency response test. So at 1 kilohertz, I set my base or 0 dB level using this graticule and this graticule. So now I'll just vary the frequency and see what we get. We're getting some noise on the line. I think that's from my uh, function generator here. Oh, so that's very good to see. We're at 20 hertz, and the frequency response is staying flat. And it's starting to roll off. Oops. That's 10 hertz. Around 3 dB down at somewhere between 4 and 5 hertz, I would say. So let's take it up to 20 kilohertz and see what it does there. Okay, we're at 20 kilohertz and we rolled off slightly. So, much better than usual. Let's see what it is at 4 ohms. Okay, yeah, this is the bad news at 4 ohms. It's really rolled off. So let's find around the 3 dB down. I'm kind of just estimating here. Around 12 kilohertz it rolls off. That's probably why they said 8 ohms is better. See, it's pretty good at 8 ohms, but when I switch to 4 ohms, it's 3 dB down at 12 kilohertz. So if you're looking for more of a flat response, you want to use this amplifier with 8 ohm loads. Okay, well, this completes the test. Let's look at my results of the power tests. I found that this amp board would uh, shut down at eight and a half volts so i just considered 12 volts the minimum i think they even say it's a little higher but it runs fine at 12 volts so with four ohms i was getting 13 and a half watts and with eight 7.6 and for a bridged output type amp at that voltage that's exactly what i would expect I'm not going to read all of these numbers, but we'll look at 24 volts, 53.1 watts, 4 ohms, and 31.9, 8. Uh, again, pretty much what I would expect. And at maximum voltage, this is where I ran into some problems, 8 ohms, I got 69.3. But 4 ohms, I couldn't really measure due to the limitations of my power supply. So I kind of just turned up the volume until it started clipping and watched the scope to see what readout I'd get. So I hit 90.3. However, by estimating from these other measurements, somewhere around 110 to 115 watts per channel at uh, 36 volt supply into 4 ohm loads. However, I will say this. I wouldn't run these Chinese boards at 
4 ohms maximum supply voltage. I would back off a little bit, especially if you want the thing to last. I would stick with 32 volts max. You still get about 102 watts per channel. Think about that. For $20, you're getting over 100 watts per channel. Not bad at all. What do you want for your 20 bucks, you know? Uh, some other things here. The uh, idle current was around 70 milliamps, so that's pretty decent. Like I said before, the distortion, eh, I wasn't super impressed, but it wasn't awful. Like I say, it wasn't spec sheet good, but does it really matter? I, I don't think you'd notice. The major issue, again, I see a lot with these boards, is the 4 ohm frequency response performance. It is 3 dB down at 12 kilohertz. It's really rolling off, but it, it looks good with 8 ohm loads. It only rolls off slightly at 20 kilohertz with an 8 ohm load. So yeah, this is more suited for 8 ohm loads. On the other hand, the low end frequency was just fine. It was flat down to 20 hertz and you know it was 3 dB down as I recall around 5 hertz or so so very good there okay so well what do I think in summary of this thing well like I said eh, you kinda get what you pay for it's not gonna have hi-fi spec sheet perfection but it does work as long as you uh, live within the limitations I previously mentioned well it's going to wrap it up for this one. Thanks for watching.